Well, I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday last week. We did not gather in uh, Bible study on Wednesday night last week, and so therefore we uh, weren't uh, able to do this on video either. But we're back this week, and as we begin, we will begin in just a moment with John chapter 10. We finished up John chapter 9 a couple of weeks ago, and so we'll be, we will begin uh, with John chapter 10 in just a moment. But before we do, want to make sure that uh, you remember this Friday night and Saturday night, we will be having our live nativity. Now, the difference is... Uh, in the last, well, really last two or three years that we've done this, folks have been able to walk up into the scene, the, the manger that's been built and that will be there, and interact with the characters in the story, interact with the shepherds there with the live sheep, and interact with Mary and Joseph in the manger, and interact with the wise men as they stood there next to the, the camel a couple of years ago, a llama last year. Uh, but because of the virus, we've decided the, the, the proximity and, and walking up in uh, to the nativity area and interacting really probably isn't the most responsible thing that we could do this year. But we didn't want to go without offering this ministry to the community as a way to, to help them focus as we move closer to Christmas on really what Christmas is about. And so we are going to have the live nativity this Friday night and Saturday night, but it will be a drive through. And so it'll be out on our front lawn just as it has been, but we will direct traffic into our northern entrance of the parking lot down the side of the property, towards the back of the property, and then loop around and then drive in front of the church, which will be there, of course, just in front of the live nativity presentation. And so that will happen this Friday night and Saturday night. I do know, uh, this being Wednesday, that we have a couple of days, and I do know that uh, Johnny could use some more folks. If that's something you're interested in serving for about an hour and a half time slot there, uh, either as one of the characters within the nativity, there are a couple of places still that need to be filled, or even directing traffic. Uh, that will be important, particularly early in the evening. Once the line is formed and people can see where they're supposed to go, it won't be as critical but certainly the first 30 minutes or so directing people into the parking lot and around so that they know uh, how the flow should happen uh, will be very important. And so if you can help us with that, uh, we would certainly appreciate it. This past Sunday, we began Advent. We'll continue that through uh, the, the four weeks of Advent. And as part of our Sunday gathering this past Sunday, we also had an opportunity that we do every year where uh, each of you that wanted to, felt led to, could um, participate in purchasing gifts for the children who are at the orphanage in Camargo. Casa Hogar, it's been a ministry uh, that we have been attached to for a number of years, many years, uh, to the point we used to take groups down and all of that. Uh, now we usually just do school supplies in the summer leading to school and then uh, Christmas gifts. And so just want to say that I am so humbled and grateful to you. Uh, all of those children, all of the slots uh, were taken by the end of the second service as we were dismissed and people went by. And so thank you for that. As a reminder, I will tell you that we do need those gifts back, wrapped and labeled with the child, uh, child's name, uh, by the uh, on or before the 13th. On the 15th, we will take all of those and load them into our van and drive them down to Rio Grande, which is just on this side of, of in Texas, on this side of the border from Camargo. And Pastor Luna, Osdi Luna, is the pastor at Primera there in uh, Rio Grande, and he is also uh, the, the man that heads up the orphanage over in Camargo. And so we're going to take those gifts to him. You may remember last year we were able to, uh, to go across and deliver those presents to those children personally and what a blessing that was. And I look forward to maybe next year being able to do that again. But for this year, with the virus and with the border being closed, we are not going to be able to, to cross. And so we are going to take the, the gifts down and uh, deliver those uh, and spend a few minutes with uh, Pastor Luna there encouraging him and his family and then make our way back. And so just wanted you to be aware of that. We need those gifts back 
uh, no later than the 13th so that they can be bagged and sorted and put in the van ready to go uh, on that Tuesday the 15th. And so that's what's coming up. There are several things also that uh, you'll be hearing more about as we get closer, but wanted you to know about that. This Sunday we will continue in Advent. We began this past Sunday thinking about the craziness of Christmas and, and all the things that we're experiencing, particularly this year, but also looking through that lens maybe at, at what the, the people that experienced the first Advent must have felt and experienced. When, last week we talked about Mary and Joseph. This week we'll be talking about the wise men and the magi that came from the east. We don't know a lot about them, uh, but we'll be talking about that on Sunday. So I encourage you to be here Sunday or join us online on Sunday and follow along as we move closer to Christmas uh, through this Advent season. All right, that said, let's move right into chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. In chapter 9, we saw Jesus heal a man who had been born blind, been blind all his life. And Jesus healed him. And, and through that uh, healing and through the, the subsequent uh, deliberations with the Jewish leaders and Jesus coming back at, towards the end of the chapter, we see this division between uh, growing ever uh, greater between Jesus and, and the Jewish leaders, and even within the Jewish leaders themselves, some of this division. And so we, we're going to pick up on that. This Most scholars would say chapter 10 follows directly behind chapter 9. And so what was going on with Jesus talking to the man who had been healed and talking about uh, that he had come to, to bring sight to those that were blind and those that thought they could see truly would realize that, that they'd been blind all this time. Uh, and that distinction. And so following that, we see Jesus move into a teaching moment in which he tries to use uh, a form of parable uh, to, to make a point. And we'll see throughout our time together this evening uh, that he, he really comes back to this same parable. He just kind of goes at it a different direction, even uses a different metaphor at one point. And we'll, get, we'll, we'll talk through that as we go. But he did that to teach a lesson, and that lesson is that the true shepherd, the good shepherd, is the one that cares for the sheep. Those who are more concerned about their own well-being and, and their own status really aren't uh, the good shepherds. They're not the true shepherds. And so that's really what Jesus is getting at here uh, in our text tonight. So we'll begin in verse 1 of chapter 10. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Uh, some would say this, this beginning of this chapter, this, this verse 1, uh, very truly I tell you, it, that, never, that, that use of those words, particularly in the Greek language, never started a new thought, but rather followed. And so that's why I say most would say this particular incident most likely follows what was going on in chapter 9. And we, he points out specifically, you Pharisees, I tell you Pharisees, he's talking to them. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Uh, the sheep fold or pen, as, as is translated here, uh, came about really prior to Jesus' time, uh, initially as a, a, a rock wall, most likely in most instances, around the side of a home. And so the, the sheep would be taken out uh, to feed and to find water during the day and then at night would be brought back into the fold for safety and for security, and it allowed the, the shepherd to, to be in his home at night. Um, but by the time the first century came along, most likely a lot of these, and we even see it in, in the, the shepherd story that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks on Sunday morning, that they were out in the fields even at night, and so they would create these, these areas, these folds or these pens, 
that they could bring sheep back into at night to protect them. And there would be one entrance into this area so that they could uh, hold it and, and, and keep this, the sheep safe and secure. Uh, oftentimes there would be a shepherd that would take turns and lay across that as the gate. And we'll see in just a moment further in this text, Jesus again shifts metaphor a little bit and talks about himself being the gate. Uh, here in this particular portion that we've read, it says the gatekeeper, or one translation says porter, but the, the gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd. And so what happened typically by the time Jesus was using this example, this metaphor, to, to illustrate his point, to this parable, most likely the, the common occurrence was that these, these pens, these folds were out in the, in the country. And different shepherds would have their flocks out feeding and doing, uh, letting them rest, eat, get water. And at night and in the evening, they would bring them back. But there would only be one fold, one pen. And so multiple flocks may be in this pen at, at one time. And so the gatekeeper would know who the shepherds were. But the point that he's making is there's one gate, there's one way in. Anybody else that got in in any other way weren't there for good. They weren't there to do good for the sheep. They were there to rob or to steal. Uh, the word there uh, in Greek is klepto, which we get our word kleptomaniac, to, to take something that's not yours. Uh, the word for robber is lesomai, which is this idea of plunder. And so what Jesus was saying is if anybody that doesn't come through this one way, it means that they have climbed over. The word actually means to climb over. Uh, into the pen. They've gone over the walls. They've come in a, the, the way that is, is not the way that anyone of, of good uh, intention would go in. And so this gatekeeper would be there and he would know the shepherd and he would let the shepherd in. In the morning, the shepherds would come to get their sheep. And this is the beautiful part of this story. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, it says in verse 3, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. So think about that for a moment. It's not specific here other than to see that based on what Jesus was saying, it was common practice that there would be multiple flocks within this fold. And so a shepherd would go, and because the shepherd knew his sheep, because the sheep knew their shepherd, he knew their names, they knew his voice. Uh, I don't know how science has figured this out, but I have read that a sheep recognizes faces as well. We give sheep a bad, bad name that they're, they're not smart animals. They, they are smart, they're just not real attentive. And so when they're nibbling grass, they're, they're looking down and they'll keep nibbling as long as there's grass. Some would say even nibble right, right off of a cliff because they're not looking up. So it's not that they're dumb animals, they're just, they don't pay attention. And, and Jesus in other places in scripture uh, refers to us as sheep. And I think that's why. Uh, it's not so much that we are, are necessarily uh, dumb but more so that we just don't pay attention and we're not paying attention to the right things. And so anyway, we see here that, that the shepherd comes in this story and Jesus talks about the fact that the good shepherd comes. He, he takes care of his sheep. The sheep know him. He knows them. And they follow him. They listen to his voice and they follow him, which would mean there are other sheep in the pen that don't come out because they don't recognize. He even says they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run from him because they don't recognize the stranger's voice. In this story, Jesus is making the point, and we'll see it in just a moment when he calls himself the good shepherd. He's making the point that only those who truly care about the sheep, that truly know the sheep, come in by the right way. Those who climb over the wall, they're not there for, for good intentions. But the shepherd comes, and he knows his sheep, and the sheep know him. They know him by voice, and when he leads them out, they follow him because they follow his voice. Notice, too, uh, one scholar pointed out that, that sheep are not driven like cattle are driven. Sheep are led. And so the, 
that says once they are all out, when he has brought all his own out, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. That's Jesus' picture of how he leads us. He knows us. And our role is to know him and to recognize his voice, to discern his voice over someone else's voice, to discern his calling over the world calling so that we follow him. He doesn't drive us. He doesn't get behind us and use fear and, and try to drive us a certain direction. He goes before and he leads us. And we listen to his voice and we follow him. That's his picture. Now we'll see he starts drawing the distinction between, and even has done so here to an extent, the difference between him being the good shepherd and those who aren't the true shepherds. Uh, at some point, the Pharisees start figuring out he's, he's talking about them. But here we are. Um, he leads them out and the sheep follow him. But they don't follow the stranger because they don't recognize his voice. We find in verse 6, Jesus used this figure of speech to try to teach the Pharisees. But we, we find here the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. They didn't comprehend it. Um, so Jesus restates it. A different way. Beginning in verse 7, he says, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus, when they didn't understand this, this uh, metaphor of, of the, the shepherd coming and the, the sheep understanding, he moves to using the same idea, but now he says that I am the gate for the sheep. I'm the one that protects them. I am the one that keeps the thief and the robber out. Um, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The reference there is that these sheep can come and go. They, they have security. They have safety. They, they have the freedom and joy of being able to come and go because they follow the shepherd. They follow the, the good shepherd. The thief, he again reiterates, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Same words that we talked about earlier, this idea of, of taking something that's not yours, of plundering. There's no good intention. They are there to do harm. Jesus is the gate. And nobody of, of, of good intention enters into the fold except through that gate. Everybody else that enters in, they come over the walls. They go in that's not the ways that aren't, aren't, uh, aren't right and aren't, aren't well-intentioned. And so he says, I am the gate. And no one enters the sheepfold except through me. Uh, some would say, well, that, that's awfully... Uh, Legalistic, that, that's awfully uh, narrow. Uh, one scholar said it's not a narrowness of mind, it's narrowness of truth. Uh, the reality is Jesus came to make a way for us to have a relationship with the Father, to make a way for us for our sins to be forgiven so that we can have eternity with God in heaven. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, God sent him to be the way. He is the way. He's the only way that we can have that kind of relationship with the Father, that we can experience eternal life with the Father. It happens through Him because He is the way. He is the gate. So He says, those who uh, come, um, the thieves come to, to kill and to steal and destroy. But then He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. It's this same concept from the verse before that, uh, the sheep go out and, and come in and find pasture. Jesus comes to give us life, full life, not to, not to destroy, not to steal, not to do something to plunder, but rather to give us life. And then he says this in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's referencing the cross. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away 
Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the one that cares about the sheep. Here he is becoming, be, beginning to make a, a pretty stark distinction. He, he's not saying that these folks that are the hired hands are the robbers and the thieves. What he's saying is there are others that, that are paid to take care of the sheep, but, but they don't have a vested interest. These aren't their sheep. And so when the going gets tough, when the wolf shows up, their mind kicks in and they say, well, now, wait a minute. I'm not going to risk my life. These aren't even my sheep. And so they flee. But Jesus says, I'm not like that. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. He's talking about most likely, most would say, false teachers and those who uh, come along and, and tickle the ears of the people. But when it comes to really caring about what happens to the people, they flee. When, when things get hard, they, they run. Jesus says, I'm not like that. You are my sheep. I love you. I know you. And I lay, lay down my life for you. I know you just as I know the Father and the Father knows me. I am here on God's business. I came to lay down my life for you. He goes on and says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. Most would say he's talking about uh, this at this point in time. He's addressing the Pharisees. And so obviously the mentality in the first century in, in, in Israel was that the Jewish people were God's chosen people. And so Jesus came to God's people. But he's saying here, just as uh, was foretold, he would be uh, the Messiah for all people. And so he's saying here, there are other sheep. Most would say this is other, other nationalities, other people, the Gentiles. Uh, they too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Talking about the kingdom. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. I want to point out that the Father sent him to lay his life down. The Father asked him to lay his life down, but he did so willingly. He didn't have to. He did so willingly. And he also says here in verse 17 that he knew he would be taking it up again. Jesus knew from the day he was born, I believe, from the day he could uh, reason and understand, he knew the cross was something he was headed towards. But I also believe that he knew on the other side of that cross there would be a resurrection. He knew all of this because he was both God and man. And so he says here, I, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So he's saying the Father and he are in one in this, that he came as this good shepherd to know the sheep, to love the sheep, for us to know him and love him, to recognize his voice. But he came under command from God, but willingly to lay his life down for us, for the sheep, knowing that once he did, he would take it up again, that we would follow him. So we pick up here then in verse 19, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. So we have this picture throughout uh, the last several chapters of this uh, animosity that, that the Jewish leaders had for Jesus, but even within the, Jewish, the group of Jewish leaders, there was this division. Uh, we may remember in chapter 9 when uh, they decided he must be a sinner because he's broken the, the Sabbath and, and they question the man and they say, how is it this, this sinner has, has helped you see? And the man said, well, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but I do find it interesting that a, a sinner couldn't do what he's done. Um, and so we have this division here. The Jews heard this, these words and were divided again. Verse 20, many of them said, He is, is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So we're back to that uh, story in chapter 9. 
So we see this division, and we'll, we'll pick up starting there next week, but we see this division in, in some were wanting the easy out to say, well, he's demon-possessed, he's crazy. He's, all of these things he's saying, he's not in his right mind. He, he's possessed by a demon. Others are saying, how can a man who's possessed by a demon do the things he's done? These aren't the sayings of a, of a demon-possessed person. And so there was this division. So we'll pick up again, as I said there, next week. But I want us to remember, Jesus is, is that gate. He is the way. He, he came to, to provide a way for us to know the Father. He, he loves us like no other. He knows us. He offers us real life both now and eternally. But we need to know Him. We need to recognize His voice. Just as in the story Jesus says, His sheep know Him. They recognize His voice. We need to be able to recognize His voice, recognize His leading. Our prayer needs to be, Jesus, we, we know you, but we want to know you more. Help us recognize your voice so that we can follow you. That should be our prayer every day. We know you, but we want to know you more. We, we think we understand your voice. We think we recognize your voice, but we want to be sure. We want clarity in that to know it's your voice and not all the voices that go around, uh, come at us from all around us. May that be our prayer as we move even further towards Christmas. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for this, this, uh, this text, the way that it reminds us of, of how you love us. Jesus, the way that, uh, that you, you know us, that you know the number of hairs on our head, you know our names, you know what, what makes us us. I pray that you would help us to know you more. Give us a desire to know you deeply. Give us the ability to recognize your voice, the discernment to know your will, to hear you so that we can follow you. I understand that so often hearing you and making a choice to follow is a step of faith. But God, I, I pray for your clarity in that, that you would truly help us to be sheep who know your voice and can follow you without fear. That's our prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you next week.